Castello Lynn. Um, today is June 9th. I'm continuing the conversation with Jim and Lori Hewitt. And first, I'd like to ask you a little bit about growing up in the different eras that you did. You uh, started high school in, in what year? Just a little bit of comparison. I started high school in 1957. 1957. And you started high school? 61. 61. So um, when you were in school, uh, were there many other Chinese students in your classes in grammar school or junior high or high school? Uh, it, before we moved, we moved to Berkeley in 1952, we were living in Colorado, which is at Naval Air Station there. Mm -hmm. So we went to a 99.9% white population. And when we came to Berkeley, what a shock. And my father bought a house only in a black neighborhood, because in 1952, Chinese were not allowed to buy anywhere in Berkeley. So when I went to Berkeley, to Longfellow Grade School and then Burbank Junior High, and Burbank High, when we live in a black neighborhood, my, my, my fourth grade class had 32, 30 students, two were white, three, four were Asian American, and the others were black. So it was quite a shock to me from white Coronado to, uh, to uh, Burbank. Now, Berkeley High School, uh, we had a class of 640 uh, students, and there were only uh, about 50 Chinese and 50 Japanese Americans. And so it was, and we definitely felt that we were minorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, did you socialize at school, outside of school, mostly with other Chinese? It was mainly with, with, uh, with, uh, with other Chinese Americans, not with, and some Japanese Americans. And, uh, but during your high school, many of our good friends were, were black, were Afro-American, female, female, men and women. But on our weekends, it was only primary with the Chinese Americans. We had to go to church uh, to do other social activities. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're referring to the Berkeley Chinese Community Church, which was the right. It used to be on Madison, and then we have two small groups down the Atlantis. Outstanding. So, uh, and what kind of activities were, were, were you involved in at the church? Well, uh, when we were in uh, junior high school, my parents said you have to go to Chinese school to observe, to learn about your culture. So, from the from seventh to ninth grade, uh, I was. Uh, I was forced to go, but of course I enjoyed it because I was learning the Chinese language and so forth, and meeting other Chinese uh, kids our age. So on weekends, we'd just go go play sports, basketball, football, volleyball, or, or go playgrounds, or go see movies, you know, John Cavanaugh. Mm -hmm. I still remember, and we were traffic boys also, and then being a traffic boy, you got to go to a Saturday night for free. So when you, when you can save you know, you can save twenty five cents, that's a big deal. Because comic books in those days cost like five cents, so you could buy five comics for like seven eighty. I'm curious, did you speak in, in Cantonese or with some of your friends? Since my since my mother refused to learn English, we knew uh, how to speak to her in our native dialect, mm -hmm. which is both all uh, both Cantonese and also say yeah. And, she, and my mother can only speak say yeah, but she can understand Cantonese distinctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But did you speak with other Chinese kids? Well, of course, uh, of course, uh, being 10 to 12, 12 to 15 years old, you'd like to only speak English. Uh -huh. So we don't only speak to, uh, in Chinese to our parents. Mm -hmm. Many other wives uh, among the 13 people, 13 families could not speak English. You're referring to the, the 13 families who right. were in the Navy as your father had been and came to Because, because just about every weekend, we would, we, we, 
I really kind of host Quick Turns hosting. Play Mahjong and play and really play people who want to grow up. And the kids would love it. It was uh, love to see each other and everything. It was great. And eating Chinese food, of course, was amazing. We had lots of many takeouts. By far being, by far being, uh, I mean, five children, we could not afford to go out to eat in restaurants. Mm -hmm. There's many uh, takeouts and restaurants. Along with other families too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Floyd, does, does uh, Jim's childhood sound familiar to you, or do you think things change? Yeah, I, I would say um, in general it was the same. But uh, one thing that was different about me is that by the time I was ten or eleven, I joined the Boy Scouts, and uh, Jim did not. Uh, but the Boy Scouts was an all Chinese uh, troop, <laughs> so well, Chinese Americans, of course. Uh, first. From 11 to about 13 as Boy Scouts, and then 14 to end high school as Explorer Scouts. So the same group. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, gentleman, in particular the scout, Scoutmaster, was Henry Foy, who was a bachelor uh, who, uh, who was sponsored by the church, and that's where we met. So uh, sometimes I would go to church on Sundays, but uh, not usually. Uh, we're not that religious. Uh, then all my best friends uh, came from the Scout Church. So, so by the time I was in high school, I, I saw all of them. Because in Berkeley, we were all in high school. So uh, even though we lived, come from different neighborhoods, we ended up in the same high school. So that's already a social bond together. Uh, when I, by, the, by the time I uh, got to Garfield and uh, Berkeley High School, uh, I was active in, in, in clubs. And so uh, you know, I got to go G at Garfield for the best grades there. By the time I got to Cal, I mean, Berkeley High School, I was very active in the local. That was not just in the American, everybody. So, for example, CSD, the CSF uh, scholarship, uh, uh, you know, the uh, high track students. Oh, we, we were heavily tracked, by the way. Uh, I was in the top track, you know, head to East Berkeley, <laughs> my mother's mission. So, I had no choice I had to go to Cal. So, uh, uh, and by the way, I want to mention that later on, whenever I went to reunion, so I, I knew we had tracking, so I always made it a, a personal goal every time we had a reunion to meet somebody else that was not on track, because uh, you got to know and socialize with many, many people when you're on track. So I wanted to break through with that. I didn't agree with that, of course. Uh, but I, I would say I, I had a more integrated experience as a result of being active. I was, for example, I was in chess team, so I met all the other kids in the chess team. So. I'd like to add something. Uh, while Floyd and I are six years apart in uh, age, it's actually five years apart in grades. Because uh, I was actually seven years old when I, played, uh, when I uh, was placed in first grade. But anyway, when Floyd started uh, grade school, my parents not allowed to buy a house anywhere in Berkeley, so we moved from a uh, black neighborhood to a white neighborhood. And so Floyd got the benefit of uh, yeah. growing up with more white kids, primarily white kids and Ruth Bridges. Right. So we moved from California and White Way to uh, Francisco and Grand Avenue. Mm -hmm. So Floyd also went to very be better schools than, than, than I went to, right. which was Whittier uh, Grade School. And, Garfield Junior High. Mm -hmm. And Garfield Junior High School was probably the best, uh, yeah, better than Willard. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. By, by yeah. better, he means the test scores and mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. academic achievements mm -hmm. greater. Mm -hmm. in, in those days, it was held pretty heavily. It wasn't, Berkeley was not a segregated city, but it was uh, less integrated than you would want. Mm -hmm. Were there many Chinese in the neighborhood? Or no, or no, actually, our neighborhood was predominantly. Or working class people, which is another term for it. It's right in the middle of Berkeley, Santa Santa Ana. So I, I had a, a bicycle club when I started called the Suicide Riders, and 15 of us would ride all over the area. And it was pri primarily uh, Chinese, not a, you know, white kids, African American kids. I was about half of the black kids. So, for example, one of my best friends from the 
suicide writers, uh, Michael Hare ended up joining the Marines. And he was killed in Vietnam in 1965. So, there's an example. So, he was one of my best friends. Yes. Upsetting down. Maybe we'll segue to something related to the Vietnam War. Okay. Um, I was going to, because you were, um, you were starting UC Berkeley in 1965. Right. Right? That's that's 1965. Right. Yeah. Um, and that was a very heavy time at UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. so just after the success of the free speech movement in 1964, right. and then the beginning of the so I'm wondering, were you affected by either of these movements? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, even though I graduated in 65 and started at Cal, officially in 65, I was admitted to Cal a year early. And I took Cal calculus at that time. And, uh, so I spent a lot of time on campus. And of course, that was a very <laughs> active thing. So walking through Sproul Plaza, you, you've got to be able to influence, listen, listen to speakers, etc. So by the time I got to Cal, I was already reactive and uh, seeking seeking answers for myself. But, mm -hmm. but I, I immediately got pretty active in the Chinese student club, even there. Mm -hmm. Despite my more integrated background, I still mostly um, look to uh, Chinese student club for social activities and, and programs and that kind of thing. So, um, and I took over the Chinese student club and uh, we ended up under the influence of the uh, women's movement, the Taiwan movement at that point, we transformed it into more of a social activist group. Mm -hmm. I, I and my best friend, Greg Mark, were the last uh, <laughs> presidents of the Chinese Student Club. And I think the poster there said 1966 was the, was the last uh, club. That's true. It, was, it ended. Mm -hmm. yeah, by it, that. I see. And did it become the, the AAPA? The yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, it, it wasn't so much that, uh, you know, I was president of one and founder of the other, but it wasn't like uh, all, all the members joined, however many did. And ma many people got more active in social policies at that point yeah, throughout the campus, okay. including the Chinese campus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So, yeah, let's, let's, you can tell us a little bit more about the founding of the Asian American sure. Alliance. Right. The yeah, that, that took place in 1968. Uh, I was called by Eugene Chioka who lived on First Street, uh, 2005 First Street, by the way, the plaque was still there. And um, he wanted to, uh, and the reason I was called was that I was the president of CFC, and, and he called all the presidents of the local uh, Asian American groups, and so we, we, we went, including the CSA, which was the foreign students at that point. But because they're foreign students, they, they weren't as uh, involved in American politics. So even though they were supportive, they, they didn't actually form for part of ABBA. So, uh, so Yuji basically asked for us if we were interested in joining a, a larger group, and all of us said yes. And Vicky Wong, who's the other founder of Still Alive, uh, says that we walked in as Oriental Americans, we walked out as Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. and the reason is that uh, the name Asian American Political Alliance was adopted by Yuji, mm -hmm. who said, you know, like Latinos, we're, we're Asian. So let's call it the APA, the American Political Alliance. So it turns out later on that was the first use of that term. Um, and <clears throat> one of our first projects, um, there were only about uh, 12 of us at the founding, and we had several other meetings, of course. And then we started getting activities at the campus. And one of our first projects was starting a petition drive against the McCarran Act, which was the legislative background behind relocation in, in, in World War II. And Yuji was born in the campus himself, mm -hmm. so and he, he used that time to teach us about that issue because I knew nothing about it at all. Growing up, in, even in Berkeley, I knew nothing about location. His father was a, a Japanese gardener, like many Japanese Americans in those days, um, and uh, uh, I didn't know anything about their background, so we, we, we learned about that. So Yuji and I spent about a year uh, knocking on doors in the Buddhist temples and the Japanese churches, and we, we were thrown out on our, on our belts because nobody wanted to talk about it. They were all ashamed of that whole thing. You know, 
quiet, don't, don't, don't raise an arcus. Uh, and luckily, uh, we, had, we were active enough that we made it on a couple years later, got the JCL to pick it up. And it became a national thing. The JCL is the JCL is Japanese American Citizens, yeah, which is a growing uh, Japanese American group. And they, of course, like, like many of us throughout the country, became more active in Japanese civil rights activity from social thoughts to civil rights. That, I think that's a general, that is a general trend in the United States. That's among the reasons why CSC ended and was replaced by many, many Asian American groups that were active in the community, in either Oakland or San Francisco. So we started Asian American Studies uh, as part of, a, so APA's first two projects, one was an education petition, which we passed on KCL. And the second was starting Asian American Studies. In fact, I, I wrote the first one as a co-op. And we started that, and even before the Black students came to us to ask for support for the strike. Mm -hmm. So we were already teaching classes in Asian American Studies, sponsored by Paul Takagi, a professor of human rights at that point. Um, and so, and, and then we had a strike. So that's kind of how, how we got linked with that. I'm curious, what were some of the classes in the early Asian American history? Introduction to Asian American history, primarily. We want to take it to learn the basic history, you know, the railroads, gold mining, the 1882, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, Carlos Bulosan, I think, uh, Maricosa de Hall was one of the first ones who went to Grand Club Library and Xerox hundreds and hundreds of copies. Of, there was nothing at that time. Uh, and that was written by a, a, a migrant worker, basically. Who worked in the Oakland Living Center. So uh, th uh, that's kind of how we got our start. Um, and then the, the strike happened, and we, for a couple of months, the part of the Bureau of Immigration Front, I was uh, uh, there were two representatives of our group in the Central Committee, and we did a total of four groups, eight, eight, eight representatives. So I was one two sent to represent the public uh, at all our meetings. But, our, our process was extremely democratic. It wasn't just leaders making decisions. Fifty members of our group would meet every night <laughs> in, in the local South Campus uh, hall uh, and, and talk all night until things were resolved. And so whenever we uh, went to meetings, leadership meetings at that, later that night, the next day, it would always be uh, from the consensus of our group. So we consulted them throughout the struggle. And that's one of the reasons why it's so strong, because uh, full involvement of uh, students. Mm -hmm. it's primarily, uh, Asian American political alliance was primarily Japanese and Chinese at that time. There were not that many Korean and Japanese people even going to school. Mm -hmm. So those were kind of the dominant. Very, also very few Filipinos, unfortunately. Um, and, and of course, the other TWF groups are you know, the Manhattan uh, Student Union and the Native American. Native American group has 10 to 10 members, period, in the whole school. Maybe you should um, tell us a little bit about the third world immigration from the yeah. strike, which started in San Francisco. So right, right. So, yeah. yeah, they chronologically first in the fall, but we in California. We also had an outdoor chapter in San Francisco as well, but uh, uh, their Asian American group was not mainly uh, APA. It was mostly other local Chinatown and Filipino groups. And uh, that was heavily led by the BSU there at the state. So their strike began in the fall. The Black Student Union? Black Student Union, yeah. And of course we went over to support them, but we were already starting to mobilize ours. So the seminal event at Berkeley was a, a symposium called Arreola, and it, it, it was a more broad, like 500 people came to it, it was a more broad identity grant. Mm -hmm. Whereas the leaders of the strike were much more political. I would, I would say we're pro-Black Panthers, anti-war, you know, much more radical, so, uh, liberation, uh, liberation, etc., self-determination. So the strike people and the our young people were slightly different, but we kind of needed each other to make it to happen. So the, the people the strike supporters, you know, the moderates, young ones, young people, 
And, and after that, as you know, at, the, at that time, in 68, once the call went out, almost every campus responded. responded. So I, I ended up traveling to many campuses, Cal State, Hayward, uh, San Jose State, you know, Public and Miranda, San Jose. I must have gone to 15 different campuses just in, in those few months. So. So was Stanford very active? Stanford was not so much at that point. Later on, later on, they got more active. Mm -hmm. So you were as a representative of the Buffalo, yeah. Uh -huh. so speaker, as a speaker. Very Especially very after our program got with Staten, more Staten. Uh -huh. I was the first uh, coordinator of the program. I, I taught an uh, introduction course. I, I, uh, I was a graduate student at that time, so I was able to teach uh, as a TA. Mm -hmm. But it was all, always sponsored by Professor Kapari. Um, mm -hmm. and so, and then uh, just a note about what's unique about our program. All decision making uh, regarding our, our program was uh, six graduate students and six undergraduate students, and they had equal vote. So there were 12 people to make decisions, and it was always by consensus. Uh, so for three or four years, our department was done like that, including all the sources, grading policy, how to get involved in the community, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was very uh, egalitarian. Mm -hmm. Throughout that year, I had a fellowship for as a PhD student sociology at that time. I had a fellowship that supported me and my team, uh, now my wife. Um, so I, I, I took the check that they gave me and I signed it over and gave it back. And we used that money to pay for other people's uh, stipends mm -hmm. to be able to hire more, more people. And how did you support yourself? Well, because I had a fellowship. <laughs> oh, okay. And I, I have to say, I, I wasn't hurt by the strike at all. I, I struck. I didn't go to any classes. But I had I got it straight A's in those classes. We were a support my professors. You know, I, I had no academic downside. My wife on the other hand, no, she she was penalized. So she, she lost the credit. I didn't. I, I was already graduate student, so I, I was more privileged. But you gave that to sign ask Floyd about uh, why you were the PhD in sociology and yeah. became a medical doctor. Right, right. So so uh, it's a very good question as to why. So we got the program going, was the first coordinator, the classes were going, it was established. But by the way, the vote to support our demands was 555 to 5. Mm -hmm. uh, it was overwhelming. I, I can't, I mean, I really didn't realize that until we came back to the reunion and I saw the minutes. You know, I, I kind of went through all the minutes and showed that I was doing a lot of negotiating, etc. And that vote was there. You know, I, I knew that we won, but I didn't really won that much. So you say the vote by whom? By the academic center. Yeah, that's what gave us the authorization to proceed. Was that 1968? 68. 68. Uh -huh. uh, sorry, 69. We, we were started in 68, but the strike was in 69. Mm -hmm. uh, January, January through April of 69. So. so, and at that point, did you feel as if the APA had, had, had success? Yes, yeah. of course, because it was, uh, it was successful. We were yeah. And then Asian America said, we saw that since we were the first program, mm -hmm. we had put all of our energy into it to make it work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it wasn't just classes on, on campus. You have to remember, for example, I sponsored the health course, and we have maybe 10 pre meds and pre health people. We sent them to Open China to do surveys and do work in the community. That gave rise to the Asian health services, mm -hmm. which today is the main provider of mm -hmm. Open China. So it was very, always very much, I have to say, the Asian American groups were more that way than the other, than the other programs. Um, because we had more people. We had more people, and I think our leadership was more connected to the community. So we've always seen it as a community project, not just the students. So that's linked to the question about why did I have to become a doctor. So uh, uh, for, I spent a couple of years to, to uh, as a graduate student, and then I had to decide, do I want to stay here and become, continue being the head of my department, or do I want to go to the community? And at that time, there was a really heavy movement to go back to the community, take, take what we've learned and bring it back to our neighborhoods. So since I had already finished most of my pre I finished up and then applied for medical school. So and I was the only one that did that. So very few of us, Whereas there's many other people that get PhDs, I'm probably one of those other people. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it
Massachusetts as an example. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I ended up leaving after a couple of years and went to New York City to medical school mm -hmm. and became a doctor. Mm -hmm. And then you came back? And then I came back, yeah, after training. Mm -hmm. And did you settle in New York for your own? Uh, we, we first, of course, lived with my mom for a little while and then we decided to move in open. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bigger city, it has a large Chinatown. Just close by, uh, you know, our kids could still see grandparents, etc. And so we decided to uh, make uh, make a difference in Oakland. You probably know my wife, you know, being the mayor of Oakland. <laughs> yeah, yes. mayor of Oakland. She's right, right down the hall here. And um, but your two clinics were in Berkeley. Sorry, your two clinics. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah that's true. Uh, but but first, I became the uh, medical director. So I, I, I trained in internal medicine when I was in the hospital. And I, I had a choice of either going to UCSF or, or staying at Highland. Because of the commitment to open, I said, I'll stay at Highland. Mm -hmm. So what, what happened was that um, it was poorly run. It was the usual county hospital uh, bureaucracy. It was being strangled at the top. Mm -hmm. So I was the president of my doctor's union, young doctors and training union. And, um, it, it, uh, we got a really bad accreditation score, so I, I made a call to remove all the top administrators of the hospital. We, we had a press conference, mm -hmm. and uh, the board of supervisor member said, "We agree with you. Please uh, come to my house and have a wine and cheese and just talk. And you do you continue organizing as a hospital, and I'll do what I need to do." Well, two months later, all four of them were fired. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so the CEO. Was brought in to, uh, to get it going, uh, put out a call who wants to be medical director. I replied, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't really plan on being a medical director. I, I wrote a 10 page paper to kind of provide leadership. And, but she liked to select, so why don't you apply? I said, Well, I'm pretty young, so I'm in my 40s, and you know, I have to meet all these gray hair people, etc. She said, oh, No, no, it's okay. I think they're, they're, they're following you. Know? Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. I ended up being a medical director. For about eight years. So you were only in your late 30s. Yeah, yeah 30, 40s, 30, 40s. So I served for about eight years and it kind of uh, transformed the whole, the whole organization of the medical staff at the hospital. So that's kind of what I had in mind anyway. That's why I went to. I'm always, uh, I'm a universal healthcare doctor and I'm one of the leaders of that movement in the country. So that's why, why I did it. And then, and then I started. Applying to jobs in the community, and like he said, I ended up being a public safety health center first, and, uh, and then later, uh, after my wife became mayor, I had to stop being full time doctor and go uh, to more part time, and uh, we had practice in Oakland, so that's so I used my Spanish. So I subsequently opened a practice in San, San Diego, but I have about 120 patients now. It's, it's wonderful because I do my entire intake in Cantonese. I called up Gina and said, I did the whole thing in Cantonese. I can't believe it. Yeah. But my brother Tony, who's uh, the most literate of all siblings, uh, gave me tips about what, how, what, how, to, uh, uh, you know, how to say thyroid disease, how to say uh, gastrointestinal, etc. Et so that was helpful. <laughs> so, with his help, I was able to do that. I, I know enough of Cantonese to be able to do that thanks to my mom. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah, back to your family, I was wondering, how did your family in the older Chinese community feel about your involvement, let's say? Sure, of course. Strike? Yeah. Um, it, of course, uh, like many people during that period, uh, the youth being really active was uh, frowned on by a lot of elders. Uh, for example, my uh, one more friend of was uh, Mr. Tom, uh, I was told by his uh, son that, uh, that uh, he asked him to stay away from me during that time when I made speeches at Berkeley Square, right? Uh, one year. And then, but then two to three years later, after the uh, People's Republic was recognized uh, for people who were called People's Republic, but uh, it was recognized by the by US, uh, things changed. And so, uh, and also we became more and more established the American Society's brought off the ground when I came back as a doctor. Mm -hmm. So by, then, by about seven or eight years later, it was, it was very different. So, mm -hmm. 
He was not. He was not discouraged by anyone at that point. He didn't have a problem with what he was doing. So as, as most things, uh, we can take time. So and, and we hope we were sure what we were doing. So obviously, by the time my wife became married, well, <laughs> that yes. was definitely a mainstream right. activity. Right. 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 I was having to add that up. We were absolutely surprised that when they found out that Chloe was born in Tsingtao, China. Yeah. He got his born born birthday. So I was born in Tsingtao, China in May of 1947. And when he came to America, he was only a few, one and a half years old. Right. right. I still Tsingtao remember. China. I still remember the Great Bridge. Mm -hmm. Going under to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course. And also, uh, since I was in the Navy in 1965 through 68, and so I was a rabble rouser, uh, leftist activist, and right. at birthday, I came home one day in my Navy uniform as a lieutenant, and so I was wearing his mouth, mouth size on jacket with a red book in his hand. Right. And we had many friendly discussions about that, why we were in Vietnam and why we should be out of it. Well, those are really uh, interesting days. Well, and the fact that the U.S. government actually later on concluded that it was wrong to be in here, I suppose, that when this first started, that's not the case, but by the end of it, that everybody was in agreement. That, so mm -hmm. as long as you keep it civil, you keep open communication, mm -hmm. especially now today, our current Wall Street Street is more unified because we have bigger threats on the right. So. But we're still a very close family, so yes. it's a, no physical fights at all. That, that's one thing I was going to say is my mother really established the, uh, the protocol for all of us. And come back to dinner on Sunday, it was always uh, live in the area, be in touch, and keep in touch with your family. Always love your family. So that, that's really a strong, probably Confucian principle for all. And we, we follow that to this day. In fact, we have Christmas at his uh, daughter's house in Custer Valley. And all, everybody came back for it. So that, that's a step I've gone So, yeah, maybe we should mention your older brother and sister. Yeah. The, the two oldest uh, became engineers. They, they were more typical uh, at that time. You know, because they, they spent a lot of their time growing up in China, so the English was not as uh, e the easiest one for mm -hmm. you um, And so both of them be became uh, mechanical engineers and electrical engineers, uh, you know, high security jobs. Uh, by the way, I think all of our siblings are married um, Asian people, not, not Chinese necessarily, but I think some of them, so, um, cousins. But everybody's Asian, you know, mm -hmm. so far, mm -hmm. until mine. <laughs> so my son married a Korean So I think mm -hmm. he's the first one to marry my son. But then everybody else still lives in the Asian community. Mm -hmm. uh, and my sister, uh, was a key, she didn't have as much education as us, so he, she became a key punch operator for the school district in the local. And her husband was an entrepreneur, was more working. People, so those are all. But they all have children, and uh, that's who we see. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I've asked my older, two older brothers, uh, they were uh, seven, seven, eight years older than us, but they felt any discrimination at Lincoln High School. And uh, since they were older, they said, No, we fit, we, we fit right in. Whereas me, being younger and growing in the 50s, and watching TV shows like Ozzy and Harriet, and uh, Father Snow's Best, we were very embarrassed to be a minority. We like to be white. Mm -hmm. In fact, there, whereas my two older brothers were you know, 15, 16 years old, so they were more uh, trained in Chinese culture. They said they, they felt very little discrimination, whereas me, uh, I felt more, and I don't, and so like, not as much either, because, uh, we, because you know, from 65 to 70, life got much better in European society. I think the way to explain the differences is that the, the older brothers, siblings, 
two of his brothers. They both married kind of his wives. So you could say that they didn't do any discrimination, but it's not like they were hanging out with two white girls. So there's that social thing. Even for me, I might get into that. All my girlfriends were Asian American. And I never did it outside of that. So it wasn't because of, it wasn't like I tried to have it turned down. It was just that that was the type of part of it. You know, it's, uh, it's funny that uh, on the phone call with Janine, she said, oh, how, how did Chinese almost uh, eventually uh, finish college and just to move the good grades? And she said, well, Janine, you know, your husband's Chinese. Who do you ask him? <laughs> and it's ingrained in our uh, it's the education is the number one priority, always. And it's not like, our family. I must say, it's not true of every family. So, uh, you know, very few out of families sent three people to Cal. So, you know, so it's not, uh, not the rule necessarily, but definitely in our case. And no longer we have to emphasize it. She bent over backwards to make sure we had time to do our homework and you know, uh, don't do too much here. In fact, she told my dad not to open up a private restaurant because she didn't want us to be a tour anymore. Mm -hmm. to, just to, to break even, you have to spend a lot of time affect your studies, so, mm -hmm. which is really true. I, th I think my, my, my older brother, Tony, I had a PhD in late 11 years in Cal. So I became a medical doctor. I think over 13 countries, I think my two brothers are most, most distinguished uh, mm -hmm. for an academic right. accomplishments. Yeah. I think we're the only doctor folks in that, mm -hmm. in that sort of social. But did many of the Captain families go to Australia. They, they all went to no. They all went to college. The they went to college. Most did not go to college. Most people don't go to college. But the, it's a tough job. Yeah, I'd say at least sixty percent of them did go to uh, four years. Four years. Four, four years. Four years. Right. You're at San Francisco State, San Jose State. Right. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Well, I just want to circle back to the end of the year. Asian American um, So I was surprised to read that shortly after the strike ended and you, know, you gained your goals, that it disbanded. Oh, you mean Alpha? Alpha, yeah. Well, it's, it, it's not exactly true because most of us were involved in Asian American studies. So we were either faculty members or staff members or something, you know. And also, the uh, offshoots of the uh, various seminars by Cal. Cool. Kearney Street became an organizing center for uh, International Hotel, which was a big uh, land, land use struggle. Uh, a lot of architectural suits went into that. So I would say it's true that the organization of uh, itself, after a couple of years, it wasn't needed as it was going on because we were, we were on the decision making while it was made for eight seconds. That was more time was spent on that. And, and then uh, the community group started. So uh, Harvey Bowen was part of uh, uh, the bookstore. But, you know, it became this way. Uh, and many people got involved with the International Club. He, I, she and I even lived at the International Club for summer before we got married. It was so uh, much a part of our lives. And so we, by doing that, we got to know the other tenants there, uh, spoke to them in Cantonese, and helped them organize. So, I would say many of the members of Alpha became community organizers. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what we were part of that. So it wasn't really officially disbanded. Now, Eugene Emma's crew, uh, he did leave uh, Berkeley went to UCLA. Uh, he got a job there in Asian American Studies. Mm -hmm. He was one of the uh, PhD uh, types, and, and Emma worked in the writing and design. She, she died recently. Mm -hmm. Emma, Emma G. Emma G. Who's one of the founders. She, she was correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. she just. Passed away, so I'm organizing the memorial for him. But Eugene died many years ago. He was a big smoker, so he had throat cancer. Mm -hmm. But he, he contributed a lot to Asian American studies. So he wrote many papers. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time.
feel about the current state of Asian Chinese studies in the United States? That's a whole different story. <laughs> I would say because we have strong community connections, I'm mostly critical of them for not continuing with that emphasis. Mm -hmm. For example, even today, a number of courses that are tied to what's going on with the Chinese government is not currently going on. Um, the uh, language seems great because Asian cultural issues came, came from one of our courses. Uh, mm -hmm. The Balsi, which is an East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation, uh, is from our land use support board. So many Balsi uh, things from the department. But the connections between the two are not that strong now. One of the few people that's continuing that is Harvey Dunn, uh, mm -hmm. because he's one of the original people. But not, not all the faculty members have that same mm -hmm. San Francisco State, on the other hand, is a much more community oriented uh, program. And they, they also have their own Kimball College, they have the more power in terms of the research. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, we're part of the Brothers of Science. You know, Berkeley. Berkeley's just a more prestigious research university, so it's harder to break in. And it's like changing the USD off. Uh, whereas San Francisco State is smaller, and so and then having a third college keeps you more at home. I, I think that's a better model. Uh, and of course, in our reunion in 2018, we tried to put some pressure on our, on our current program to be more community oriented. But you know, from the outside, we don't have as much to say as uh, we used to. So uh, all we can do is try to encourage the students to, to get involved. How about um, organizations which give Asian Americans a voice on campus? Would you say that they're pretty strong? Pretty strong. Uh, that's what I mean by CSE is a very good one, but uh, God, there's so many other councils and groups, and uh, it's a much more uh, organized uh, compared to 1965. I mean, virtually, I would say 50% of Asian American students are connected to something that's going on. Of some type, so that is, that's a big change, mm -hmm. and many have taken Asian American studies, mm -hmm. so that that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows about the railroads and the uh, 1882. Mm -hmm. They they can even tell you what that was about. So that was not the case before. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's much more pride about farm workers and the you know, Chinese Town community and those things, and I think we have a lot to do. I mean, and now we have political leaders, we have mayors, we have assembly <laughs> people, you know, et cetera. We have a majority of the same legislature. In fact, ethnic studies are now required in uh, every Cal State uh, campus in the state as a, as a graduate to take ethnic studies. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's uh, the school district has also done the same. The state legislature uh, mandates it. So the thing that we fought for and won. 69, 70 is now required for what you say. So I would say that's progress. Yes, it sounds like there were really significant short term and long term successes. It's, it's, easy, it's uh, easier said than done, though. Making it work is not as easy as it appears. You have to have faculty, you have to have teachers that are trained, mm -hmm. and resources to do it. Uh, and so, of course, we were getting involved in that. And my wife is a former mayor and his uh, father, Gary. Mm -hmm. We try to work. David Chu, for example, He's going to be a future mayor of San Francisco, but uh, he was in assembly, and so he was pretty, he's one of the people behind the requirement. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it's, uh, it's one thing to require, it's another thing to make it happen. <laughs> so, and yeah, that was the way that had that. I can know that we're talking just 50 years later, from 1970 to 2023, mm -hmm. and prior to, prior to 1965, though, predominantly Chinese from the Guangdong province of China. Right. So 1965 the Great Green Wall change. Now we have Chinese from all over China coming over. And that Mandarins don't know about the Cantonese in here, that the Cantonese don't know the, what the Mandarins say. So so now in 2023 it's totally it's totally different among the Chinese community. Including Chinese people in San Diego, Boston, Washington, D.C. So, so, so much different. My, my brother and I are both involved in uh, local efforts to bring Chinese American history to our community. So, he just came from uh, 
of Yosemite to connect with their uh, I organized the Marysville Code pilgrimage every year, and we we started a fishing village. So it's all the same goal is to uh, educate people about uh, histories. I mean, Monterey is one of the beautiful places in the, in the state. And for many years, I would just visit there and say, yeah, I heard there was a, used to be a fishing village here. Didn't it burn down? <laughs> and, you know, for about 10 years, we didn't answer the question, why did it burn down? <laughs> and last year, we, after years of organizing, we got the uh, Pacific Grove City Council to apologize mm -hmm. for that burning down. So, so there was a Chinese fishing village? Yeah, that's, like that's where the fishing arson. That's where the fishing industry came from, in the right. yeah. But there's not much there now. We don't have the fish. But during the 1800s, uh, Led by the Chinese, and the fishing world was just learning that's what the sense of the mm -hmm. And the fact that we got the local city council to apologize for that, that happened. We, you know, nobody's sure who can cause the fire. It doesn't matter at this point. It's more the fact that the Chinese were mistreated. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, getting larger communities to do that, most of our coalition is not in Chinese. It's white people, you know, white people. So, mm -hmm. that does a really good thing. The API gate thing has kind of unified us. <laughs> That's a bad thing, but we've now turned into a good thing. Jim's part of that. What were you doing in Yosemite? Oh, uh, I was doing a normal annual trip. Uh, I told you that you were sending your letter about the Chinese uh, workers here. Primary, the, uh, the uh, Southern California Museum. Did the pilgrimage to honor uh, uh, the, uh, the cook, Sing Tao. Sing, Sing Tao. He, he worked there from the 1890s to the 1930s. He was the uh, main chief cook for the uh, geological survey there. And even Teddy Roosevelt gave one of his meals there. So about 30 of us from Sacramento, uh, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese Council. I have some rich council in Sacramento. I went there two, uh, two weeks ago to learn about the Chinese uh, non-blue workers and the Chinese workers there. There's a picture of Homer Lee here. He spent two years in uh, Yosemite beating a bear and the end in the little press gun there. Showed that to the National Park Ranger, Yan Chan, who's an Ivy League graduate of Yale. She got so excited seeing it. She was one of the hostess of the leaders uh, of the speaker. She got so excited to uh, send me more information. And I came back home and I had to contact her chief and uh, we, so she was organized this two years of life. So you're speaking of Homer Lee, the home of Lee's Floors. Yes. Right. Yeah. Floors to That's the right. Yes. Yes. So he was besides the Chinese restaurants, he, I think he was the only owner of the Chinese business in uh, Berkeley. When he was running. There were Chinese restaurants. Though. There were many Chinese restaurants. In fact, two or three of them uh, were owners here. Uh, the, the 13 families right. were maybe. They were cooks in the Navy, so it's easy to start uh -huh. a restaurant. Whereas mm -hmm. Albert was not. So. Mm -hmm. But Wilton and Chilton were both very active restaurants. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Also, you know, today. in the 50s and watching uh, TVs in black and white, you could you would never see any Asian, Japanese, or Asian faces on uh, in, in, the, in the program, the half hour sitcom. And we do see it Chinese, Chinese in the, in the, uh, in the movie or the program. We, we got so excited, we'd be calling each other up and say, hey, turn on Channel 7. Mm -hmm. There's a Chinese guy in there, and you know what? Those Chinese guys were always playing it. either a cook or a laundry one or a server. Mm -hmm. So, so even in the 50s. So, uh, the fact that Michelle Yao. Very segregated. Michelle Yao was on the best actors uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't until Bruce Lee in the yeah. 60s, right? Right. Bruce Lee and Sun Kim were very proud to be Chinese. Mm -hmm. And prior to 1960, we were very embarrassed that we were second class citizens. Along with the blacks, the Native Americans, you know, the Asians. It, it sounds like um, the, the, the APA changed that 
somewhat on campus if we just can uh, get there on. So, yeah, not necessarily the organization itself, but the programs that have started to get, get that public done. And getting the students to learn about the location, to learn about ACU, to just have it spread through the community. And the, the best and the brightest at Calhoun do it, so do it. Yeah. So, yes, of course, and it's not just Berkeley, it's staying, Cal State, in Cable, San Jose State, all of them. But it sounds like the AAPA is a training ground for future Asian politicians. There have not been Asian politicians. So. Well, my wife's an example of that, of course. Um, but um, yeah, um, yes, yeah, becoming politically active, of course, whether it's a demonstration or you know getting involved in your local community, it's that's just a, doing something. So I would say today's. In fact, as we became here in San Francisco, and uh, you know, things that you look like is winding up already. I mean, that's definitely the point of our own. So, for sure. The current open neighbor. The current open neighbor is. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, you got to remember. She's, 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 she's 37. She can't believe it. She's, she's, yeah. She's, yeah. Well, thank you, Jim and Floyd. Thank you. Thank you for, for doing this.